Hello, everyone. This is Larry Bailey here with Ridge Lending Group. Welcome to another weekly installment of Live with Chaley. Uh, today is July 26, 2022, and uh, the stars have aligned in such a way that not only is Chaley not able to be present with us today, but I am uh, feeling like poopy. So uh, that's a technical term for those that have never uh, been accustomed to calling themselves that. But uh, for me, if my voice goes or if I cough in your ear, I apologize up front. I'm doing my best to make sure I don't do that. Uh, today's episode is going to be uh, form formatted into an open Q&A. Um, I really only had one thing that I wanted to share with, uh, with the community uh, with today, and that was, that was a guideline that Chaley and I came across uh, towards the end of last week with regards to financing homes with short-term rental histories. So uh, historically, if a property has short-term rental, um, can't really qualify for uh, typical financing because there is no lease, right? And so, uh, so we're gonna talk about that, but I really wanna open it up. Thank you everybody for coming today. And I wanted to open up if you had any questions, if you wanted me to go over any scenarios any feedback on any recent information, um, those kinds of things. So uh, welcome to everybody. And, and if, you, uh, if you like, you can use the chat if you don't wanna ask yourself, or you can certainly take yourself off mute and, uh, and ask. So I'll go ahead and give everybody a moment if you wanna to get together any questions. If not, I will bring up the guidelines for the short-term uh, short rental program, short-term rental qualification guidelines, I should say. Awesome. Okay. Well, I certainly I'm I'm used to this where people are shy and they don't have questions. I do want to ask one um, before I, I kind of get into the um, the uh, I think it's here. Sorry, I'm making sure I'm right. I've got the correct I should say I've got the correct guidelines. So one of the things that I always wondered about, as far as those that are showing up here um, and also getting involved in real estate investing is do you keep a log or do you keep um, goalposts, anything that you have set up for yourself so that when you're looking at 2022, it's already past the middle of the year and you look at how you started 2022 and what goals you set, um, are you actually documenting what those goals need to be? And uh, if so, how are you keeping them on track? Is anybody actually doing that in real life? I'll say, Larry, that in other areas I do, but <laughs> where my husband and I are trying to get started in this area and we keep hitting roadblocks, this has been the one that we haven't. Yeah, it's tough, right? So it's kind of like one of those things where it's really easy. Like, I, you know, my whole existence and professional existence, rather, has been in banking, right? And I started as a teller in 87, went into mortgage banking in 93, and I've kind of landed here since. And so to understand what has to happen in mortgage universe, very, very sensical. I could understand it. I could spit it out and sleep it probably. But when it comes to like real estate investing, as I've shared with the team before, I'm, I'm not about buying and holding. Like it just doesn't jive with my core. Uh, I'm all about buying something. My wife and I have a talent of fixing things up and selling them. Uh, sometimes we hold on and we, move, we end up moving there as our primary house, but usually we'll fix it and flip it and, and be done with it. Um, because I can't come to planning like an investment. Um, and so what I thought was interesting was there's plenty of resources. There's an unending amount of resources that talk about financial planning for your financial investments. And even, even at Ridge, like we get into these details of how to qualify for a property. And we've tried to help, Jaylee's tried to help a bunch of folks through the Certified Power Buyer Program. But when it comes down to it, you have to, as you know, as an investor, Nicole, for you and your wife, uh, sorry, you and your husband, um, you have to uh, make sure that you've got something spelled out and to say, hey, what's our, our ROI that we're looking for? Where are we comfortable investing in? What's the quality of home that we're investing in? Um, like recently, somebody was talking to me about a property and the house was... Um, 
old, right? It was older than 10 years. And I remember earlier this year, I got into a conversation with a higher investor and they said, if the property is older than 10 years, they don't care how good it looks. They're not interested because they're worried about maintenance and repairs. That was their golden rule. So, um, so I thought I might bring some of that flavor to today's conversation to say, um, you know, there, there's things that I've seen other people use, um, but most importantly, are you using anything to really track what you're interested in investing in? And is that a roadblock for you? And it sounds like, Nicole, for you, it is. Sorry. Yeah. So my husband and I have both are on a different track with our careers this past year. So we're hitting roadblocks and that he's a contractor too. So just hitting roadblocks. And when we go to get financing, oh, you haven't been at your job and he's self-employed, you know, building houses and stuff. So it's like, oh, great. So now we have another roadblock. Oh, wait. Oh, the investor that we had that wanted to jump in on things, you know? Yeah. 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 So we're just like, oh my gosh, can we just get to <laughs> get to the good part? Yeah, it's uh, so um, what have you, so Nicole, if you don't mind sharing, when you, when you, if, if you could wave a magic wand over your situation and actually get an investment property that fits into what you think you want to invest in, what does that look like? Um, of all the ones that we found. So we're looking at um, ones for Airbnbs for vacation. Yeah. Um, we live in a vacation spot up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, yeah. but we're also looking in Florida um, over on the West Coast. So our house right now, my husband's been working on it so that we can rent our house out and then he's going to build something for us. But the ideal would be for us to have a single family down in Florida, three bedroom um, in Punta Gorda, and then also have some other that is our starter and then start to generate some revenue with that so that we can begin, um, you know, steamrolling and purchasing other single family homes. My family does this there and my brother does um, a mix of residential and commercial real estate. My dad and and other family members do commercial real estate. So we see the, the, how nice it is to blend it, but we want to stick with residential mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, and we'd love to try a multifamily and see if that's something we'd be interested in. But where my husband also, you know, we're, we initially started at like fix and flips yeah. um, because where he can do all the work, we he can do, do the work. work. Right. That's, that's kind of where I, that's how I fell into it. Right. It just makes sense. But yeah. you know, right now in our area where the market is, it's just not ideal yeah. for us to just scoop something up. I mean, the prices in our area are a little crazy right now. So um, not any worse in California. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, he was just out in California and he said the same thing about that. So um, so our ideal is to start with the single family. So at least we can, you know, dip our feet in it and, and get going with that. And then, um, you know, do that for one year, then the following year, get another one. So potentially it, a third in the second cash? year. Is it cash that's holding you back or is it finding the house? Like what's. Yeah, we've found, oh my gosh, we found so many that were like, this would be perfect. Um, and where we're at, so we were going to take equity in our house. So we have about 300 in equity, probably a little more in our home. Um, but because he started in his self-employed business, going back to being self-employed last year. And then I just started with a new school district. I'm an assistant principal. Okay. Um, I went, so we flipped. So he was working for a company. Um, he had injured himself when he fell off a roof. So he had to let his body heal for a bit. And I was self-employed and then we did a flip. So at that time we went to go get a home equity. And you got stuck. Um, when I still had my business, even though it was lucrative, it was during the pandemic because it was still fairly a new business. Yep. So when we decided, all right, let's angle things a little different. Let me go back into the school system. So I got, you it's know- stable. Yep. Good, stable job um, in administration. And he went back to building. So we're like, all right, perfect. Then he'll have the time that he can go build and, yeah. you know, do the property management thing. But just last week, you know, the, the person we spoke to, the lender was like, well, you know, if he can get the home equity in his name, and then we do this in your name, but still we're hitting with the, he needs to be two years self-employed in order to get a loan that's what they're telling it's for a line of for the line of you mean for the line of the home equity line of credit so when we tried the home equity yes a couple years ago um that's when they said that so that's 
had us reshift. And so I guess we do keep track with our goals um, and we're trying to angle things so that we can just. So assets for you just to kind of, and I really appreciate you sharing your personal story, Nicole. Thank you. I'm sure everybody else does too, because it's always nice to hear what somebody else is going through um, because it's tough. It's tough to, you know, usually folks, the biggest problem is, is cash, right? And, and a lot of times, unless you're born into money or somebody dies and gives you money, it's really hard to accumulate cash. And so um, like the majority of us, we end up gaining, um, we get a property and we get lucky and we get equity and we get a lot of credit against it or we sell it and we get cash. And we kind of make that little snowball turn around. Um, but I would, I would, uh, I'd encourage everybody's listening to this story. The, the, the line of credit, if that's the sole source of cash, um, it may, uh, you know, especially for what you described earlier, where you're thinking about fixing up your primary home to turn it into a rental, right? And mm -hmm. then you may end up doing something else. Weirdly enough, if you if you could push the gas on that move you might be in a situation where you can use, you know, I don't know the cash, the whole cash situation or the housing situation, but weirdly enough, you can do a, a debt service coverage ratio loan on an investment property, which could be your home now to take the cash out, to do all these other things that you want to do instead of relying upon it as a home equity loan. The only rub to that idea, that concept is where are you going to live? Right. right. You can't, you're not going to lie about where you live, that's, that, that's never a good idea. Um, and, and if that's your only way to get income out, or excuse me, assets out, you, again, you're not the only one in this situation. Um, folks that have a lot of, of, uh, of debt equity, as Shelly would say, they have equity in their home, but they have no way to access it, and it sucks. It's frustrating. Um, so you know, I would... Um, so from a qualification standpoint, debt service coverage ratio, of course, requires no employment. So that whole conversation goes poof, it goes out. Um, another thing that you might, um, if you're thinking about getting another place, and you said you're in Massachusetts, right, Nicole? We are, yes. So you can also, um, one of the things that we have is a blanket loan. So another way to possibly look at this is to do a blanket between your primary and an investment to try to bridge this little gap, um, you know, and then and then um, work on it maybe that way. Again, I don't want to, you know, obviously there's a ton of information that, you know, it, this isn't the right setting to share, but those are some ideas that, you know, from a, from a lending perspective, it was one of the reasons why I've stayed in, in mortgage lending for, for three years or for 30 years, three years, for 30 years. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I like puzzles, but what's more important to me is figuring out ways to make it better overall. Um, so, you know, if you want to kind of talk through your scenario offline, Nicole, and figure stuff out, um, you know, having two years self-employment is not the real whole sentence. It's two years, in some cases, two years tax returns filed, okay. which okay. is longer than two years self-employment. Right. Right. So, um, but then I'd be interested in, it, you know, looking at your situation. Is there a way for us to use your income to qualify? I don't know. That it's those kinds of things that are bouncing inside my head of let's peel apart the onion and see how, how deep we can get. Uh, so uh, Eddie, who's not too far from you, he's in New York. And I only know that because Eddie constantly wants us to lend him money, but we can't because he's in New York. Uh, so Eddie says... Hey, Nicole, I've, I've been in your shoes three years ago. I'm currently working with uh, the Navy and I don't like being away from my family eight months out of the year. Yeah, that's horrible. I mean, that's just sucks. I'm sorry. Thank you for your service, Eddie, but damn. But I stick with it because I wanted to, to take a HELOC for my primary residence. So, so Eddie's plan was to sacrifice stability, which you've done, Nicole, and there's a lot of people who've been self-employed and they go take a W-2 job to get the financing. Um, that's the other side of the coin. Uh, thanks, Eddie, for that inspiration, because, you know, if your husband's been in contracting for all this time, I don't know if there's a place that could pick him up and he just goes and works and pulls a W-2 to get the financing and then he goes back to doing whatever he's doing. Right. You're on mute, Nicole. Sorry. He, um, he did that before, but he was... 
The other problem was knowing how much more he could make on his own. Well, which, you yeah. know, it's true. And then being able to work on our house while, you know, paying the cash for the things on, on our house yeah. while we're getting this ready to. I know. Yeah, so it's planning, right. It's tough. It's, it's, yeah. it's making decisions that you're not quite sure are perfect. Um, but from a lending perspective, um, again, for those that haven't, you know, followed along since April or March, whenever Shaley and I started these shows, you know, I, I grew up in lending on the East coast, Shaley grew up in lending on the West coast, but we, we kind of have the same methodologies where we understand guidelines. We listen closely to scenarios and situations and figure out how to leverage guidelines to your, your advantage. Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean it always works. Um, it doesn't mean it's always pretty and nice and smooth. Uh, sometimes things get hairy, but uh, there's usually a way to figure it out if, if you've got equity and if you've got credit and if you've got income. And the income part's debatable because, again, if it's not a primary house, um, you know, you, you might be able to pull debt service coverage on it if, if you've got um, rental income on it. So, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for sharing, Nicole. And like I said, if nothing else down the road, if, if you want to reach out, we can bounce around some things. And I would love to. I would yeah. love to. Well, you can, you can, uh, the office number, you know, if you don't have it, it's 855 74 Ridge. Uh, my email is L Bailey, spelled B as in Bravo, A I L E Y, at ridgelendinggroup.com. And uh, like I said, Chaley's out for the week, uh, having some fun in the sun somewhere, I hope. And, uh, you know, anything we can try to do to help figure it out, more than welcome. Great, thank you. Of course. Uh, I, I did want to bring up the short-term rental um, guideline. I, I kind of touched on it. This is in our, our V series I talked a couple of weeks ago about. And um, I think I just posted today, the 12th. Hang on a second. Yeah, yeah. It was a 12th replay. I mean, literally just a few hours ago, I think we finally got that posted. So um, part of that V series, which I didn't see, and Chaley didn't see, we were going through it again uh, last, end of last week, is you can use short-term rental income as long as you have a 12-month look-back period determining the average monthly rents from annual or monthly statements from places like Airbnb or similar services. And I want to talk about this. I got really excited about this because if you're buying a business, and, and Nicole, you mentioned your family's in commercial, so your family understands this I'm sure a thousand percent clear. Doesn't really matter what's going on with the physical brick and mortar. It matters what the business is doing. And so if the business is profitable, you're going to pay more. If it's not so profitable, maybe you pay less. But the idea with residential financing is historically we're limited to what is your tax return say? And you can use uh, leases if you're financing it in the acquisition year on a refinance or you're purchasing it, you can use lease income. But well, what do you do if you're buying a place that's typically a short-term rental property? You're not going to ask for the tax returns from the seller. Like that's never going to happen. In commercial, you can do, um, you can do financial statements um, in the due diligence process for commercial lending. That's normal. You can ask for tax returns for the business, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to short-term financing, there hasn't really been anything. And, and Chaley and I stumbled across this and we were both like, wow, that's really cool. So basically, if you find, if you're out there shopping for places, Nicole, um, you know, especially in a resort town, if you if you find out that they have if they have Airbnb or short-term rental income, um, that might significantly help your qualifications. To use you as an example, I mean, this goes out to everybody, obviously, but so like I spend time, a lot of time in in Hawaii. It's where one of my daughters lives, and it's an aspiration of mine to buy a second home in Oahu. It's, it's where I would like to die someday. It's where I want to be. I've got family here in Jersey. I can't quite make that trip for you uh, permanently. But the fact that I can, you know, it's hard to find a property in Oahu that's not short-term rental somehow. But if I can go in there and use short-term rental history with a 12-month look back to qualify, it makes everything so much easier. So I wanted to just talk about that. Um, and, and make sure everybody's, uh, you know, understood it. And uh, if there's any questions about that, I'll give everybody an opportunity to ask. Does anybody have any short-term rentals in their portfolio? 
So if you're looking to add one, um, this was typically one of the biggest problems. You typically, as a, as a, as a uh, an investor, if you if you're well qualified, you might not need to um, you might not need to worry about rental income, and that's great. Um, but for the average person out there, you typically need income from the property to help offset the the new PITIA payment on the property um, to scale out with your investments. So this is one of those things. <coughs> Pardon me. This is one of those things. Or in your case, Nicole, again, sorry, we're picking on you all day, but in your case, Nicole, if you turned your house into an, you know, into an Airbnb and you started racking in 12 months history, that's something that, again, could be used in, in qualifying. Naturally, um, you know, it's going to be reported on your taxes, but, uh, you know, if you need to finance that property and you didn't have your taxes filed yet and you didn't have leases, what do you do? This is one of the ways to kind of deal with that situation. So it's so a little bit of a niche, but um, it's possible. And those are non-recourse loans too, by the way. You're typically made to LLCs. The V-Series is all about um, lending to the entity, uh, not to the person. So that has impacts too on your overall portfolio. Uh, for those that just joined, uh, we've been talking about uh, financing and um, uh, for the last 20 minutes, Nicole shared uh, a very moving story about how she rescued a puppy from the top of Mount Everest. It was very special. You missed it. But uh, now we were just talking about um, situations of, of having um, an investment uh, goal, set of goalposts. So your, invest, your investment plan for the year, it's already July 26th. You blink and it's going to be September before you know it. And then you're going to be getting that email blast from Chaley saying, hey, it's the end of September. If you're going to buy something this year, you got to do it now because October, November, December goes so quick. And, um, you know, once December 31st is over, you're done. Uh, loans are closing on that topic. Loans are closing. Uh, purchase loans especially are closing in less than 30 days for a standard loan product. If you're doing something like an all-in-one program or some other type of unique product that we have to have re-underwritten outside of, of Ridge Lending Group. It is taken 45 or, or even some cases 60 days. Um, but if it's if it's one of our standard products, um, it's going pretty quick. Appraisals are coming in in about a week right now, which is phenomenal compared to where they were six months ago when they were like at three weeks, if you're lucky. Uh, so things have changed quite a bit uh, for the better. And uh, you know we're always here to help with uh, scenario reviews, things like that. So the, for those that were just had just joined, did you have any questions? This is really an open Q&A. We're gonna be on here for about another five minutes or so. Uh, so if I any... have a tech question. Um, is the Zoom meeting link the same every week? It is. Okay, cool. Cause I was just having some technical difficulties. Right. And is that my fault? I... Is it no, my no, fault? no, it's not, it, it's not your fault. It's my yeah. fault. Yeah, he's, he's being very friendly today. Um, I just didn't have it saved in a place I could find it easily. So um, if it's the same, then I will just save it so I can yeah, avoid that. You yeah. should be able to. And if you RSVP on the community too, I think it sends you a reminder with the link. It does, but then like I try to do the Zooms on my iPad so I have my, it doesn't take up the extra bandwidth on my computer. And then sometimes if I'm not logged in on the iPad, it will like prompt me to, it's. Zoom's really weird. I don't, it's it's reliable. Like I had issues with Teams. It's great until it's not. And yeah, then you're just like, right, right. Right. yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. Oh, you got it, Lisa. Thanks for asking. Uh, anybody else have any other questions, guideline reviews, scenarios? How does something work? Um, why does something happen? Especially if you've talked with another lender. I always love the situations where, uh, like in your case, Nicole, you talk to a lender about something. I, you know, it's great. Um, when somebody does the research, um, sometimes folks give answers in, uh, in a process that they think they're right, even though they haven't done the research. And I would always say when it's something that important, where it could mean the difference between you qualifying or not, um, have them pull the guidelines. Say, hey, listen, do you mind just pulling the guidelines and just making sure nothing changed? Guidelines change all the time. From Fannie Freddie straight down to a non-QM investor that comes into the market and leaves. So um, always ask your lender if you're having trouble qualifying or 
um, is challenging somehow, just say, hey, listen, can you pull the guidelines? Let's go through them together. I always think that's healthy. I don't think enough borrowers do that. Um, I know I do, because what I do, but I always suggest to my family members, if they're trying to do something, A, why don't you call me? But B, um, if you're, if you're uh, getting kind of the, the impression that things aren't going so well, um, just ask your lender to be clear and concise and uh, transparent about what's happening and why. Usually helps. Okay. Uh, is there anything on the community from uh, content wise uh, that we could add? Um, I know I'm still working on this book club thing I talked about last week, I guess it was. Uh, I got a couple of honorable mentions from Axel, but um, I didn't put it as a post from last week's replay, so I haven't really asked anybody. The idea is um, if you're interested in reading a real estate investment book or you have read it, um, one that you think might be appropriate for the rest of the, of the community. Um, I, I said to Chaley, I said, why don't we do a book club, review it together, talk about concepts um, that are in, you know, the article or the book um, or the podcast, or I know some people just listen to podcasts all day and that's fine too. So it's all about just staying talking about what we're doing because it's a tough road. It's a tough road. Hey, Larry, uh, Neely here. I um, have just a very general question for you or folks on the phone that have lived through it. Um, so my husband and I are gonna be new to investing. And one of the things, I guess, just from recent history, we're looking at single family homes, uh, long-term rentals, just kind of building a portfolio of just, you know, buy and hold. Um, when the pandemic came around, I'm not, I, we weren't investing, so we weren't as close, but hearing stories of landlords who all of a sudden, um, you know, were kind of up a creek because there were so many grace periods given to tenants and it was like really almost one-sided from, from my perspective. I, like I said, I wasn't intimately involved, but it's kind of this um, little hang up uh, in the back of our minds, I guess, of like, what if that happened again? How did, you know, the cash flow sort of interrupt everybody's um, plans or did it? Or was it just on a case by case basis about how severe that period of time really hit for investors and anybody, landlords specifically? Anybody want to take that from a personal perspective? I can take that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I have eight single family rentals. I had four of my tenants move out at the same time. Thankfully, I didn't have to evict them, but they didn't pay rent for a lot for a gigantic chunk of time. They also caused some damage. So I had I had four expensive make readies at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, cash flow kind of took a gigantic hit. And what I would say is you just want to have reserves um, and uh, plan, you know, just have reserves. I did end up getting a lot of money from the government programs that went right to landlords. Great. Um, so it did end up kind of catching up towards the end, um, but it was kind of hairy in there for a little while, but it was also kind of like a black swan event, I guess, where I don't know that we would ever see that kind of um, scenario in the future where, people just aren't paying rent because, and you can't evict them. Yeah. Yeah. 2008 was a different situation. Um, yeah. Really. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I think in a magic world, you always have 12 months reserves for every property you own. Lisa, is that a formula you use or you use something different? Um, I have to revisit my formula now. Cause I did, I wasn't mentally prepared. I thought I was, I, well, <laughs> I, I, thought I, had... I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, you know, it's great. And um, it's great. silver linings. I did. I probably needed to do some of that repair on those properties anyway. And I've been able to increase the rent on all of them. And I'm almost back to full occupancy again. So we're kind of coming out of it. And once I get everything back to full occupancy, the cash flow will return to probably like 4,500 a month after, after, I pay the property manager and the mortgage, but before repairs or insurance. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's a decent return, um, but I wasn't expecting to have to go through, it was more 2021 was really kind of the rough year. I see. Um, and, and I don't know that that's something that would ever, that would ever happen again, but you kind of have to just make sure that you have enough reserves 
um, and look at the other the other benefits to it, like the tax the tax element, uh, or like the tax savings um, and appreciation as other benefits to being in the game as opposed to not. Right. It's not always about the cash flow. It's about the total picture. And although you, it's nice. The to cash get- flow is a big thing though. Is that, I mean, that's why I got into single family rentals. Cause I like, I want my money to make money for me. Like it should be working. Um, and I don't want it to just be making money on some kind of appreciation play where I have to either sell something in order to recognize that, um, you know, whether that's real estate or the stock market or whatever it is, if it's just, if, if I have to sell an asset in order to recognize the, the gain, um, then that's not some, that can be an element to it, but that's not my only parameter. Like I want to have a monthly, I want money coming to me on a periodic basis. So um, that's one of the reasons I got into single family rentals in rentals in general to begin with. Um, so it's a consideration. It's not the only thing because there's, there's tax, there's depreciation and tax savings and um, you know, appreciation is part of it, but I don't, for me, at least that's not my only, um, like, I'm not going to buy something and say I can forego cash flow for five years because there's appreciation involved, like other investors are doing. That's a, that's a whole different, that's a whole different setup. It's a whole different right. setup. Right. Well, and also like, I want this to be passive. Like I have other jobs. Like I'm in, re- I'm in real estate rentals with, a, I pay a property manager because I don't have the time or the bandwidth to deal with it on a regular basis. So if I were gonna, if I were gonna look at something similar, maybe like maybe cash flowing notes <coughs> where you don't have the tax benefit, but you're getting a cash flow on a regular basis without having to, to without having out. to do the active income. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's my two cents. Uh, it's, it's, I'm coming out of you. it now, but it, 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 it was, I'm not going to lie. 2021 was, was rough. And I was kind of like, what, why am I even playing this game? <laughs> but, Makes you wonder. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing. You're welcome. <clears throat> Bailey, it's all about reserves. I can tell you that. I was, that was the only thing I was going to add was you, you just have to make sure you're prepared for not getting paid. And what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. So property manager, right, Lisa? good attorney in the state that the property is located in it's also good um just to be prepared just in case but ultimately uh you know it, it's not a it's not a set it and forget it kind of a thing it's it's actively making you sure. definitely yeah you have to manage them you have to stay on top of them you have to make sure that your property managers are doing with their jobs and stuff it is it it, it is a little less active than some other strategies like wholesaling or, or, you know, if you were the property manager yourself, um, there's, there is some, there is more passive to it, but you can't just set it and forget it. You do have to pay attention. It's a job. It's yeah. A job. yeah. <clears throat> Glory but I did, right, I, I did get into single family rentals thinking that I would have to, this yeah. would replace my job and I could be financially free and never have to work again. And I'm definitely having to rethink that. You're still working so, on it. Come on, you can still, still working it. on that. Still working right. on it. Still working on it. Before we so. wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I had properties during COVID and stuff like that, but I was really blessed. I didn't really have, I had single family and then I have one commercial property and everyone seemed to pay. Um, I thought at first that I was going to have to take some hits, but um, I was very proactive at the time or reactive. You know, once I heard, I was definitely on the government um, program sites program. and stuff like that, trying to find if, you know, what programs were available, if tenants shouldn't pay and that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, knock on wood, I, I came out of it pretty well in that regard. Yeah, I think it's a mixed. But I, I'm concerned. You said 12 month reserves. Um, that again, these are these are these are just ideas, right? So uh, the, the idea, if you're going into a buy and hold strategy, is um, what do you what do you want to have in your personal bank? Some people have a larger cash flow, so they don't need to necessarily re- rely upon their reserves. It, every, it's a little bit uh, personal. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're the kind of person that you know, I always ask, uh, and we. We do it in underwriting. We're like, hey, listen, you need six months reserves for qualifying. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just a standard government Fannie Freddie program. Um, 
but that's just the loan that you're doing. If you're like leasing, you got eight properties. We're not asking for six months reserve on every property. But, you know, should you be asking yourself that question? That's really. I see. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Better to be prepared than not. Well, you try. You try. Yeah. <laughs> Neely, are you, you okay with that? Anything you want yeah. to add? Yeah. I appreciate the shares. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Hey guys, I'd love to talk more, but I need to go and take care of some things before it gets much later. Thank you always for coming to these and participating and uh, we'll keep them going as long as you want. So hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.